So I'm interested in reconstructing, to the best of our knowledge, what happened in 1948 and what's the most complete and true-to-life way of telling the narrative. Maybe you can articulate to me why it is that you've decided to choose ethnic cleansing as the framework for understanding what happened in 1948, if, if that's a correct characterization. Yeah, absolutely, absolutely. Uh, ethnic cleansing uh, is a common term when uh, in a mixed, in an area where you have a mixed ethnic population, one uh, group uh, gets, rid, gets rid of the other group. Uh, various means of doing that. Uh, first of all, it begins with ideology, with uh, abstract ideas when, for instance, in the case of the Zionist movement, you already envisage the mixed country as being uh, purely yours, even, we don't, even when you don't have the capacity to implement the dream. And there are plenty of quotes from all the Zionist leaders, from top to bottom. Uh, this is the, the wet dream of Zionism, to see Palestine without Palestinians. So there's already an ethnic cleansing ideology, not yet the operation, but an ethnic cleansing ideology. And that's very important to establish, because uh, uh, we need to establish the fact that uh, there is an ideological will to ethnically cleanse a population. Right, so, so my understanding is some of the contention that does exist, because the quotes are the quotes, and, right. and you can't really do much about the fact that they exist, right, if you're, right. if you're arguing a different narrative. But part of the contention, and correct me if I'm wrong, is that at least some streams of Zionist thinking prior to 1947, 1948, was that the achievement of a Jewish state in all of Palestine could be achieved simply on a demographic basis if there was mass immigration of Jews to the land of Israel, so much so that it actually swamped out the local population, which would preclude the need to, in scare quotes, transfer, essentially expel, possibly with compensation, large numbers of Arabs. What, what do you say to that argument, that, that in, some, in some sectors of Zionist thinking, it's, so long as there were enough Jews, this wouldn't be a problem and, and transfer wouldn't be necessary, again, in scare quotes? Yeah, I'm not familiar with such quotes, I must say. Uh, I don't think there are such quotes. I think that there, are, there is a twin argument for how to create the Jewish state without Palestinians. We will bring many, many Jews as possible uh, will find ways of getting rid of the Arabs. You cannot unpack it and say that they had uh, one talk about uh, being, bringing Jews and then they seem to you moral and then you separate say oh these may be the different people or even if it's the same people that's a different point of view. No, it's a comprehensive point of view. Immigration of Jews to Palestine and emigration of Arabs out of Palestine is the very natural uh, a project of settler colonialism, which Zionism is. Every settler colonialist movement wants to bring as much as it can from the settler community and get rid of the natives. It happened in the United States, it happened in Canada, it happened in Australia, and it happened in Palestine. So wh wh what would you say to those who argue that well, there were many flavors, so to speak, of Zionism, um, you know, from, from the end of the 19th century leading up to the establishment of State of Israel. Many, there was cultural Zionism, there was political Zionism, evolutionary Zionism, and at least half of the Mapam, if I understand correctly, not the Mapai, but the Mapam, was of an ilk that actually wanted to see a binational state and didn't have any incentive, did, didn't, ideologically didn't have an incentive to expel Arabs. So if there were people like that in the Zionist camp, is it a question of Zionism writ large? being inherently tied up with, inextricably, with transfer or expulsion, ethnic cleansing, if you prefer? Or were there streams that one could have pulled apart and it's just that the political momentum um, and all the historical contingencies of the time pushed everything in a direction that necessitated from their ideological perspective mass expulsion? Yeah. Well, uh, settler colonialism comes with some universal ideologies, not only in the case of Palestine, also in the case of the United States, also in the case of Australia and, and Canada, uh, and Argentina and Brazil. People come with both revolutionary ideas of universal values and a practical aim of creating a new homeland. And the main obstacle are the native population. Now, for a while, and that happened in, with the Zionist movement as well, for a while you hope you can reconcile your universal ideology, such as socialism, if you want, bionationalism, 
uh, with the aim of creating a settler state. But once it becomes a practical project, the universalism is slowly disappearing. There's a great book by the Ed Sternal, a Zionist a scholar, who shows exactly how it happened. There's another great book by Gershon Shafir, who shows how it already happened in 1914, that the universal ideology was giving way for the settler colonial ideology. Can you unpack this just a little bit for us? I know. Yeah, it, it, what happens is you come with the idea of uh, liberating workers, whoever they are. Uh, but then you say, I cannot create an Arab Jewish trade unions. I mean, that's, that would be against the idea of Hebrew labor, of Jewish labor, which is why we created the Zionist movement. So we will create a Palestinian labor trade union that we will control. Yes, it's not ethnic cleansing, but the reason it's not ethnic cleansing is because you're only 10% of the population. There's a limit of how crazy they could have been with what they thought they could do or not do. And maybe they even thought that they have reconciled it. They reconciled the wish to create a Palestine without Palestinians and universal obligation to liberating workers wherever they are. And then it's a, it's, it's a, it's a time process. As, as, the, uh, as their uh, presence in Palestine continues, and as the native population begins an anti-colonialist struggle against them, universal ideology is thrown out of the window. Uh, Mapam believed in by a national state, it is true, but one has to explain why did the Mapam soldiers in the Palmach, why did they play such a crucial role, a brutal role, a criminal role, in ethnically cleansing the Palestinians? They, they committed some of the worst crimes against the Palestinians. And after the villages were destroyed, they were the most greedy uh, movement among the kibbutzi movement for taking over the Palestinian villages that were deserted. And, the, was, and the Palmach, just to be clear, is the uh, so, sort of the... The, the political party out of the, the socialist movement uh, of Hashomer Atzair. I mean, we're talking about the left wing of the kibbutzi movement, which you mentioned as supporting bionationalism. It also had another wing called the Chduta Avoda, which also had uh, a, a bionational ideologies. But these ideologies, the more I'm thinking about them, I, I don't think people were not genuine. They really wanted to be both uh, a colonialist and a universalist. Like the State of Israel, it wishes to be both Jewish and democratic, and it's impossible. There cannot be a Jewish democratic state. Either there will be a Jewish state, which will be a racist, apartheid, ethnic state, which is Israel today, uh, or it can be a democratic state, but then it cannot be Jewish. It, it's impossible. This is uh, an oxymoron that the Zionist movement invented, A, because maybe people thought they can reconcile, as I say, universal ideologies with ethnic ideologies, or more cynical ones, and I expect there were some cynical people there as well, said it's good for commodifying Zionism outside of Palestine as a project of socialism, of communism, liberalism, and later on as democracy. But the essence of the Zionist project is an essence of the settler colonialist movement. And no settler colonialist movement could tolerate the presence of native population. There isn't one example in the world where settlers came from Europe with uh, a, an idea that the natives can stay. The best they could hope for was South Africa. They can stay, but under a, a segregative uh, system called apartheid. So if we're making the comparison to other settler colonial projects, specifically where there was, let's say, a, a metropole that they, that they emigrated. Oh, no, 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 you're wrong. I'm sorry, I'm stopping you. Settler colonialism has no metropole. You are totally wrong there. Classical colonial movements have metropole. Settler colonial movements work against the metropole eventually. They are assisted sometimes by metropole, like Zionist movement needed Britain, but they are not serving the metropole. On the contrary, the settler colonialists in the United States worked against the metropole. The settler colonialists in Australia worked against the metropole. The settler colonialists in South Africa worked against the metropole. No, no, there's no metropole. That's why the, that's why Zionism, uh, Zionist scholars try to say, oh, there was no metropole. No, no, but that's totally wrong. It's not a, I didn't say it's a classical colonialist movement. It's a settler colonialist movement. So let me define for you settler colonialism so that you don't make this mistake again. Uh, settler colonialism is a movement of people who are persecuted in Europe for whatever reasons, economic, 
cultural, religious, throughout the centuries. And they run away from Europe with a one-way ticket. They don't want to go back to Europe. So this would include uh, religious minorities in, in France? and Absolutely, and the Huguenots, the Protestants later on. Absolutely, people who were chased out of Britain. And they come and they want not only to create a new home, they want to create a new homeland. And the main obstacle is the fact that there is someone else there. So they work according to what the great scholar of settler colonialism, Patrick Wolf, called the logic of the annihilation of the native. Now, you can annihilate the native physically, as we know people did, or you can annihilate the native by expelling him or her, uh, or by segregating the system. I mean, there are various means of, or there are various interpretations of annihilation. Right. So, for instance, so I'm, I'm Canadian, and, and uh, well, what we've finally come to, to recognize to some degree historically is that there was a strong impetus to um, not not physically eradicate the native population because so much of that had already been done essentially by uh, by microbes okay. wittingly or un otherwise right but to uh, to quote unquote kill the native save the child so there was a cultural annihilation and it's an attempt to fully integrate these this quote unquote native population into whatever it was that the settler colonial saw as you know as progress as the future of the society so in that case um, Within this this umbrella of annihilation, are you including, I assume, efforts to at least culturally assimilate or culturally absorb the one-time native population oh, yeah. into oh, a yes. new entity? Oh yes, but Zionism was too racist for doing that. They even had the problem of what to do with the Jews who came from the Arab countries in 1950. They were not sure they wanted to assimilate them either. They had to bring them over because the Jews from the United States and Europe did not come. Jews. Uh, the Ashkenazi Jews were lost after, I mean, uh, they lost great, in great numbers, were killed by the Nazis. So they decided to bring, reluctantly, the Jews from the Arab countries. And they hoped that they could de-Arabize them. One should say quite successfully that they, this human engineering worked. So this is an interesting point, because I think what some people would say is a disanalogy between the settler colonial paradigm and Zionism is precisely that second stage, in the sense that one could make this argument from a devil's advocate perspective. If you, if you step back, like let's say about a decade or so, and you take the, the entire context into, into focus, you could say that what happened was actually more akin to a population exchange, such as you saw in, uh, in Turkey and Greece, after the, you know, the deconstruction of the Ottoman Empire or even in India and Pakistan, because you had an approximately equal number of Jews from Arab countries or Jews from Muslim countries leave their, their native homelands and emigrate to Israel within a, a 10 to 15 year period after the Palestinians themselves had been expelled. So from that perspective, if that's how you choose to frame it, and of course the framing is a choice, but if that's how you choose to to create the bounds of your framework, you could say, well, this was a population exchange. What do you, as a, as a person who, who is very committed to articulating this as a Seth of Colonies project, how do, you, how do you reconcile that argument with, uh, with your well, framework? It's a ridiculous argument, to, to, to be honest. Uh, first of all, not one Palestinian came from, uh, not, not uh, the, I'm sorry, Iraqis, Egyptian, Palestinian, Syrians are not the same people, so I can't, I can't see the, what, what has the movement of Jews from Iraq has to do with the expulsions of the Palestinians from Palestine. What's the connection? The Jews of Iraq did not belong to, to, to Palestine. Uh, secondly, apart from the case of Iraq where there was really expulsion, in, uh, by the way, triggered by uh, subversive actions by the Zionist movement, uh, apart from that, uh, Jews choose, chose to em immigrate to Palestine. They wanted to come to Palestine. That's the whole idea of Zionism. Palestinians did not want to leave Palestine. So it's, it's a different analytical framework. One is ethnic cleansing, the other is immigration. And it's not the same thing. So, so is your argument then that the, the Jewish communities in these various countries, be they Iraq, um, uh, Morocco, uh, the remnants of the Ottoman Empire in Turkey and elsewhere, Syria, elsewhere, uh, it, they, had, they had basically freedom of choice. They could say, okay, I'll stay. It's relatively safe for me. I, I don't see a problem for my future here in Even this country. Even if it was not safe for them. 
even if it was not safe to them. What's the connection? It was not safe for Christians to be in Iraq, let's say. How is it connected to the expulsion of the Palestinians? I mean, you have to be a Zionist to accept this. You have to be a Zionist to say that the Jews in Iraq belong to Palestine. But then you get into trouble. If the Jews in Iraq belong to Palestine, you as a Zionist movement, wants, you want the Iraqi government to expel the Jews. In fact, you work very hard to convince the Iraqi government to expel the Jews. Yeah, but what you mean there, if I understand correctly, there were uh, literal political programs, uh, opaque and, and non-opaque, to, to encourage the Jewish communities in these areas. But that's Zionism. Of, it, it, there's nothing wrong with it from a Zionist point of view. We want the Jews. That's why Zionism and anti-Semitism is so much in common. Even Zionism and Nazism had something in common in the early 1930s. They have one common uh, ideology, to get the Jews out from wherever they are and bring them to Palestine. Now, in the case of Iraq, the Mossad agents planted bombs in Iraqi synagogues in order to make sure that the Iraqi Jews would feel even un more unsafe than they already uh, felt because of the 48 uh, war. And that's a matter of settled history. The oh, most, yeah, yeah. Those there's, no, there's, no, there's no argument. Again... Do you know any good sources for, for actually oh, reading yeah, about that Yeah, you can that, that read sort of Yudha have about it and, and uh, uh, someone called Malka, for his family name, I forgot his first name. Uh, they're very proud of it. They're very proud of it. They being the Mossad? Or the Mossad or agents who worked on it. It was not easy to, con they will tell you, it was not easy to convince the Moroccan Jews to come to, to, to Israel. In fact, the elite went to France and Canada. Yes, uh, if I understand correctly, Mor Morocco was, was, a, was quite a different uh, situation. But also Tunisia was a different situation. Yeah. Also Algeria was a different situation. Syria and Lebanon were a different situation. Egypt was a different situation until 56. Uh, Egyptian Jews uh, did not want to, to leave Egypt. And when, and when they had to make the choice that Nasser put to them, are you Zionists or Jews? And they could not answer that question. They got into trouble with, with Nasser. And there are Egyptian Jewish uh, diasporas all over the world. In fact, there is an Egyptian Jewish diaspora in Israel. <laughs> so it's a diaspora. It's not the same. It's, it's, the, 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 there is no dialectical connection there. It's not an exchange of population. It's, uh, it's on one hand is the a settler colonialist movement that ethnically cleansed the native population. On the other, you have immigration, sometimes because of ideology, sometimes because of uh, economic issues, cultural issues, uh, people immigrate. You know, one of the best way of showing how uh, absurd this comparison is, is I can tell you every Palestinian in the world supports the right of Iraqi Jews to return to Iraq. Not one Iraqi Jew supports the rights of the Palestinians to return to Palestine. And that shows you that this is the end of the debate. There's nothing to talk about here. It's two different stories. And of course, people can ask for compensation from the Iraqi government. People should go back to Morocco if they want to. This is nothing. Palestinians want to go back to Palestine. In fact, the international community recognizes the right of return. Uh, of course, the international community would recognize the rights of Iraqi Jews to go back to Iraq. I can assure you, the present Iraqi government would love the Iraqi Jews to come back. So we, we, we see that this is, these are two discrete issues that have nothing in common apart from within the Israeli propaganda, of course. You wanted to to find a moral argumentation for the expulsion of the Palestinians. Uh, I don't think anyone serious in the world is taking it. Uh, anyone in the world takes it seriously. Uh, people know that the Palestinians are not coming back because of Israeli power, not because of uh, problems with international law or because the, there, is a, you know, there was a deal with the Arab world. No, the only reason the right of return is not implemented is because Israel is powerful enough to prevent it. Right, which is a strong, again, disanalogy to what others would argue, you know, parallels population exchanges in other parts of the world in the wake of the crumbling British Empire. You're saying this, yeah. is, this is a clear no, distinction. A, a clear distinction. Uh, if all the Palestinians went to a Palestine, they created the Palestine, and all the Jews went to an Israel, uh, and they were all, like in India, were all living there for hundreds of years, then I would find the problem. But who were the Jews in 1948 in Palestine? The, they were one-third of the population. 
the vast majority of them arrived three years earlier. Three years earlier. Uh, how can you compare it to the Muslims and Hindus who lived for millennia in, in, in uh, the subcontinent of India? I, I, you know, the mosquitoes and, uh, and helicopters both fly, but it's still, they're still not the same, you know? They're still not the same. Having discussed that, maybe we can move on to your understanding of the processes that occurred in 1947, 1948, and what actually led to the Palestinian refugee crisis, essentially. Right. Um, because the, the, the nitty gritty, the details of the intentionality involved in different mm -hmm. stages and the, the programmatic nature or lack thereof, I think is, is really, that's my understanding, is where a lot of the historical contention in serious histor history, historiography, yeah. lies today. So how, how would you articulate it to a, yeah. to a lay public? Uh, by the way, just a general remark, I don't agree with you. I think that uh, the main debate used to be about facts. I think the debate now is about the moral interpretation of facts. Uh, but uh, that's putting it aside. Uh, and, and I think what really makes the operation in 48 and ethnic cleansing, even without agreeing on the nitty gritty, whether it was intentional or systematic or not, is the fact that Israel did not allow the Palestinians to return, which is an established fact. It's an official Israeli policy, in effect. Is it not, is it not they don't allow them to return unless it's within the confines of, or within the rubric of a comprehensive peace it negotiation? It doesn't matter, according to the international law, uh, uh, the Palestinians in January 49 had the right to return. You could not condition it by peace. Nobody did. In fact, the United States imposed sanctions on Israel throughout 1949 for not allowing their Palestinian refugees to return. Uh, unfortunately, uh, American policy changed later. But anyway, we'll, 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 let's go to the, what you call the integrity. Um, I think the, the, the crucial moment is February 1947. Uh, when Britain decides to leave Palestine. As I said, there was already an ideology of ethnic cleansing, uh, very much part of the Zionist ideology, but there was no capacity to implement it and there was no historical opportunity to implement it. February 47 provided that opportunity. Uh, I don't think in February 47 they, they were clear on what they want to do with the Palestinian population. Uh, they first uh, reacted to uh, the new situation by trying to take over governmental, uh, you know, um, centers of power, uh, create an infrastructure for the state. I don't think much was debated about the fate of the Palestinian population at that moment. They had more important fish to fry. And just to be clear, so that moment was the United Nations? No, no, no. It's, it's before. It's February 47. Britain tells uh, everyone uh, that it does not going to, it's not going to stay in Palestine, and it transfers the issue to the United Nations. We don't know yet what the United Nations is going to decide. Right, but Britain has now officially announced. Officially announced. Yeah, we are turning this over to the United Nations. Very interesting. The Palestinian leadership doesn't do anything with this announcement. They think it doesn't matter. They, they are sure that the United Nations would do with Palestine what it did with Iraq. Well, oh, well what's, what, what Palestinian leadership was there to speak of at the time? Oh, there was. There was an Arab higher committee. Most of its members were in exile, but they still met. In, uh, there were uh, local national committees. Uh, there was strong connection between the Palestinian leadership and the Arab League. Uh, so they had to, they digested the news by saying that probably the United Nations would uh, apply the same principle it applied in other mandatory situations, where the majority would decide what would be the nature of the state. And the Zionist movement understood that if you allow the majority to decide the nature of the state, there will be no Jewish state. But I'm, as I'm saying, I don't think immediately they, they dealt with it. I think that only after the United Nations petition plan was adopted, in November 1947, and it was clear that the Arab world and the Palestinians are not going to accept it, then it, and I think the documents also show it, I think that the crucial moment is the 29th of November of 1947, when the leadership of the Zionist movement understands it has an historical opportunity because of the Arab rejection of the partition plan uh, and because the partition plan gives international legitimacy to the Jewish state, although they hate, as Ben Gurion stated very clearly, even openly, not just in secret documents, he stated we can never have a viable Jewish state 
within what the United Nations accorded to us. And the reason was that, according to the United Nations, the part that was accorded to the Jewish state had an equal number of Jews and Palestinians in it. Uh, and also so he, something like, like 51 to 51 49 to 49. percent. Yeah. And also he said the, the, the borders are not viable. But, but he said it doesn't matter because the Palestinians in the Arab world rejected it. What will determine, he says very clearly. And we have explicit written documentation. Oh, yeah, yeah. Like but as I said, this was not even secret documents. These are his speeches uh, in front of Mapai, the major uh, party, in which he says um, we will need to have at least... Uh, uh, a population where we are 80% of the population, not 60, 40, not 40, 40, 80%, and we need 80% of the, of, of the land if we want to have a viable state. He's very clear about it. 80% uh, of the land being 80% of, of mandatory, mandatory Palestine. Mandatory, mandatory Palestine, Palestine, excluding Transjordan. Yeah, which is very interesting because the Zionist movement uh, gave the United Nations, when they, they started their uh, deliberations, they gave them a map. And in the map, they uh, offered that the Jewish state would be 80% of Palestine, which is Israel today without the West Bank. Very interesting. The United Nations thought there was too much for, to give the one third of the population, most of them immigrants who came a few years before, to give them 80% was a bit too, even they thought it was a bit too much, so they offered them half of the, more or less half of the, of, of the country. But I think, you know, let's say, if the 1st of December, uh, and, and what, I, what I think the documents show, that two things they show. First of all, that there is a small group of people who decide to take upon themselves the decision-making uh, process on the fate of the Palestinians. They're very secretive. They don't share their ideas with others. They meet quite often, led by David Ben-Gurion. They are called the Avadamia Etzet, uh, the consultancy. Uh, it's an ad hoc move, uh, a group. It is not uh, established uh, like, you know, Zionists were very organized. Uh, they had the elections and so on. This is not, nobody is elected and so on. Nonetheless, these meetings are being documented. They are being secret. documented, although they're not minuted all the time because it was secret. I mean, uh, that's the nature of secret meetings. Every now and then you can go uh, and find, maybe there are. You know, my friend Gadi El Ghazi says, and I think he's right, we've only been shown 2% of the documents of 48. Only 2%. Do, do we know that that's, uh, like, just in terms it's, of actual volume, that's oh, accurate? Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. It's absolutely accurate. Only 2%. So I don't know. Maybe there are minutes for all this meeting. I had to reconstruct them through Ben Gurion's diary, through interviews with people, through, uh, you know, uh, actions that had orders that I assumed were decided by the consultancy and so on. There is no file, organized file of the consultancy. But it's very, it, it, but, but there's enough material to see how the thinking develops. There is Palestinian rejection of the partition plan. There are even Palestinian actions against the partition plan. Attacks on Jewish uh, transport, attacks on Jewish um, settlements, demonstrations, petition, although they peter out. There's very interesting, uh, a remark by one of Ben-Gurion's advisors who says they, they peter out too quickly. We need them to, to show more resistance in a way. They're sort of worried about it. And why were they worried? And that's the second thing that happens. They, suddenly they see something which will become part of the Israeli DNA. If you want to feel good with something bad you do to the Palestinians, you need a pretext. And the Palestinians at first provided the pretext. They attacked the Jewish settlement. They murdered a Jewish bypasser. So you can retaliate. And at first, the retaliation is not ethnic cleansing. It's uh, tit for tit. But then comes two things happen. The Palestinian resistance peters out. There's not much to react against or retaliate. And secondly, you suddenly see that what is de described as retaliation becomes more orientated towards uh, chasing people out of their villages. Uh, in, but it takes a while, and I describe it in my book, The Ethnic Cleansing in Palestine. It takes a year for it to gel as a strategy. By February 1948, it's already a strategy, and then it makes its way into what is called Plan D on the 10th of March 1948. And more importantly, it makes its way to what is called the orders of Plan D, or status B, Matzav Dalet which is thousands and thousands of orders that were sent to the people, uh, to the troops on the field. So that's kind of a trajectory 
And those, and those orders themselves are documented? Are they are documents. Again, we, we have many of them. We don't all, all, all of them. We have enough. Right. So, so my understanding is that, is that one point of contention, even within the new historian cadre, mm -hmm. is the interpretation of Plan Dalet, right? Of um, whether it says, this is how we're going to, um, uh, in a generous interpretation, this is how we're going to defend the nation state against the incoming Arab armies. And to do so, we have to make sure that we don't have a fifth column at our rear versus, aha, now is our chance. This is how we're going to expel yeah. the Palestinian population. So, so <laughs> what can you do? I think Plan D is is, is straightforward. It's straightforward. It's, it it says uh, uh, the Palestinian villages and towns have two options: either to surrender or to be kicked out. And then comes the question: Why did people who surrender also were kicked out? But were they all kicked out? Not all, but many of them. Many of them. We will come back to the question why they're not kicked out. But all of the Palestinians in Haifa were kicked out. All the Palestinians of Jaffa were kicked out. All the Palestinians, all, all urban Palestine was ethnically cleansed by the 1st of May 1948. And this was a direct implementation of Plan D. I think part of the bone of contention is that people focus on the document that they have, which is called Plan D which was the political document. I, what I did, I said, Plan D is not just this document, which said, you know, as you say, we will defend ourselves against invading Arab armies, and we are just talking about the area which is between us and the Arab armies, and there we'll do that and that. But if you look at what I call Matzav Dalet, the orders that were given to the brigades and the brigades to the battalions and the companies. And these weren't just spoken orders, these were no, written No, 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 these are written documents. Uh, you can see that the same method that Plan D uh, suggests for applying to the, uh, to the uh, villages and towns in what was called Retsuata Bitachon, in this uh, security zone, are applied to every village and neighborhood in Palestine. Every village and neighborhood. Every village and neighborhood. In fact, you could easily say that, um, it is very interesting, the, the one, one uh, uh, brigade I really looked at, uh, really focused is the Alexandroni Brigade, where I really could find, uh, uh, you know, uh, the orders. It does say in the end of every order, it says basically what to do with the population after you occupy the village of the neighbor is up to you. This appeared in every, basically, it's up to you. I interviewed a lot of officers and so on. They said we understood that as kick them out. Some of them, it's true, some of them, in, in few cases, uh, decided to let them be. It's true. So there was some variegation, A variegation, but, but people understood, people understood uh, what was uh, uh, to be done. So the now, understanding was it was a wink-wink situation, or, it's a, or it's, it was a, we'll leave this to your discretion, No period. ethnic cleansing operation in the history is, uh, as you can see in the uh, ethnic cleansing operation, uh, ethnic cleansing definition in the State Department definition. They, even in the worst case of ethnic cleansing, which we had in the 1990s in Serbia, there were no direct orders like that. You create an atmosphere. The soldiers know what they have to do. That's why oral history is as important as the documents. You know, every Israeli trooper I uh, interviewed said to me, come on, are you joking? We knew what we had to do. You can see, by the way, you go to the Zohrot website, they have uh, 30 to 50 interviews with Israeli soldiers from 48 who, who say to the camera, we knew exactly what was expected of us. Are these some of the people that ended up, ended up turning around and suing after they, had been, after they had seen themselves on film, essentially, and decided, wait a minute. That's only one of them. Only one of one them. One individual? One individual. Chaim Guri, because he's, uh, and, and Fischke, because the, both of them are national heroes, and so they had second thoughts. But most of them. But, uh, you know, I interviewed them even before Zohrot. Um, the orders, uh, uh, you had three kinds of orders, if you want. There were, first of all, let's say about urban Palestine. It was clear that urban Palestine had to be cleansed. There, there the, soldiers, the uh, commanders were not said it's up to, for your discretion. No, you had to kick these people out. It was preferred to have a quiet uh, transfer. That is true. They liked the idea if the people of Haifa would leave uh, voluntarily. 
So, so Haifa specifically is, is confusing yeah. for me. I'm trying to wrap my head around this okay. because what I've heard is that the, the mayor of Haifa, the Jewish mayor of Haifa at the time, specifically requested of the local Arab population he did. to stay. He did. He and, was not part of the leadership. Right. And the Arab High Committee, in this particular instance, actually suggested people leave. No. What happened was that uh, the, the Arab, you have to remember, this is 21st, 22nd of April. This is after uh, Deiria scene, uh, after already Tiberias is being cleansed and Beisan. And, and so, so uh, there, there is a sense among the leadership that uh, uh, an organized eviction is better, but it's eviction. They didn't want to leave. <laughs> you describe it as, as, as if they wanted to, to go in, uh, on a picnic and leave the town. They, 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 uh, they decided they can save the people with an organized eviction. That is true. Organized from the Zionist side? Or no, no, with the British, because the British are responsible for law and order. And the British are criminals. They should have said to the Zionist movement, we are responsible for law and order. Not one Arab is going to live here. But they didn't. They, fac they facilitated negotiations between the Jewish forces and the, Jewish, and the Arab leaders. And the Arab leaders said, OK, we'll have an organized eviction. So people were told to come to the harbor, or the area of the harbor, on the 22nd of, of April. And then they were bombarded from above to make sure that they leave. Right. So, you so have it's the Haganah that's bombarding them. Yeah. But at the, at the same time, correct me if I'm wrong, is it at the same time that the mayor is making pleas to the Arab community not to yeah, leave? Yeah, yeah. I mean, this is what I'm saying. The, the systematic ethnic cleansing was not organized by the mayor of Haifa, who had very good connections with the Jews, uh, with the Palestinians. Of course, he was not. He was a Zionist who didn't want to see the Palestinian leave. I believe he was genuine in this. But the commander of the, uh, 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 you know, the Carmeli uh, Brigade uh, that was uh, ethnically cleansing Haifa had no wish for the Palestinians to leave. We have their orders. They had orders to kick people out of Haifa. And the orders are all the Arabs, everyone, out of the city? Uh, yeah, of course, to empty the city to empty the city. Now, there came this moment, which happens. You know, it happened in ex-Yugoslavia as well. The leaders of the community say, let's, let's do it in an organized way, you know? Let's, let's take them out because uh, uh, they cannot stay. Something ha terrible would happen to them. And while they are organizing this eviction, they are being bombardment, bombarded uh, from, uh, from above. So it's a concern for their safety or it's a concern for being viewed retroactively as as being complicit in the process? Like what's, who, what's, who, the, what's the incentive from, from the, the side of the Arab leadership oh, to, to facilitate? Save, to save the population. Full stop. Yeah. Remember, Dir Yassin is in the background. Jews massacre Palestinians. There are rumors that they're raping women. Uh, it doesn't matter, by the way, whether they were substantiated or not. And the intelligence, as Benny Morris showed in his book, to his credit, the intelligence unit of the Haganah spread these rumors all the time of what would happen to you. Uh, so, yeah, there's fear, great, great fear, great, great fear. And you remember, they, they thought that they will evict them to Akka, which is 15 minutes drive from Haifa, and that they could come back. They didn't think that they were evicting them forever. They thought there's fighting, it doesn't go well, the Jews are quite barbaric, let's take them out. The idea was for... This is why people left things as they were. Nobody really packed. Uh, and, and the reason was they thought they could come back. And in fact, the United Nations, the United States, Britain, wanted the people of Haifa to come back from Akka. They told the Israelis, why are you not allowed? OK, there's an, you know, in the first truce, June, 9th of June, there's a truce. Bernadotte is here. The United Nations mediator says to the Israelis, OK, the people of Haifa should come back. Just to be clear, Bernadotte, he was, he was a Swede who actually saved Jewish refugees yeah, he was in the, Europe he during the He was the Second president of the, um, of the uh, International uh, Red Cross in, in Sweden who saved a lot of Jews in the Holocaust. And he was appointed the United Nations mediator. And he arrives in Palestine on 20th of May, 48. And he says, OK, these people left. He, he didn't blame the Israelis for the uh, expulsion of the people of Haifa or Jaffa. He said, you remember, when he arrives, all the cities are emptied already. Uh, so he says, let these people go back to Jaffa. Let these people go back to Haifa. 
uh, and let's stop this madness. For him, it was madness. Why these two communities should, should fight each other? And the Israeli position is very clear. Anybody who left is not going to come back. Is not going to come back. That's their documented position. They That's a documented, and they were very proud of it. They didn't hide it. Uh, and it didn't matter whether you left voluntarily, so to speak, namely you left because you were afraid, or you left because someone put you on a lorry and, and kicked you out. So this is ethnic cleansing. You have to look not at the nitty-gritty. You have to look at the big picture. Now, of course, hundreds of thousands of soldiers were involved in it. And they act as they as they are now. One hundred of thousands of soldiers are uh, busy uh, policing Palestinians in the West Bank. Some soldiers are more moral. Some are more barbaric. The big picture is not the individual soldier who does something differently. The big picture is the ideology, the the overall impression you get from the overall commands, and the behavior on the ground, behavior on the ground. Um, for, I'll, I'll give you an example. Uh, the commander who occupied Safad felt pity for 100 elderly people. And he allowed them to stay. They were 80 years and, and over. Ben-Gurion, in his diary, and I, I quote it in my book, The Ethnic Cleansing, writes an angry letter to the commander of Safad. Why did you leave these 100 people in uh, Safad? We want Safad to be totally empty for, of any Arabs. That's an example. Uh, Haifa, you know, a few thousand Palestinians were left in Haifa. Yes, yeah, so this is partly why I'm so confused about Haifa specifically. No, no, a few thousand out of 75,000 is ethnic cleansing. 5,000 out of 75,000. 70,000 were kicked out. Now, kicking out for me, again, is also not allowing you to come back. That's very important. If I am afraid in, in Tel Aviv, because uh, I think Iraq is going to bomb Tel Aviv in 1991, and I go to Elat, if you don't allow me to go back to my flat to Tel Aviv, you've kicked me out of my flat. It doesn't matter that I ran away because I didn't want to be killed. Seems like See? a reason. That's ethnic cleansing. Ethnic cleansing is the smoking gun I agree, there is no, there is no ethnic cleansing in the world, including, by the way, no genocide. There is no smoking gun for the Nazi decision to, to, to exterminate the Jews. Uh, there is no smoking gun. In, in, by, by smoking gun, you mean actual documented actual document policy? Actual document that says there are six, 12 million Jews in the world, we will kill 6 million of them. No, there is no smoking gun. But the smoking gun for the Israeli criminality is the decision not to allow them to return. Because that nobody can argue about it. You can argue morally about it, whether Israel had the right. I think there are small smoking guns for uh, decisions on localities of expulsion. And I think there is, a very, for me, a very convincing case to be made for a master plan, systematic plan, and so on. But you need, like every good historian, you don't get one document. It's a puzzle. You have to recreate the puzzle. And as historians, we are entitled to argue about whether I did the puzzle correctly or not correctly. I don't mind. I don't mind people arguing uh, with me. Uh, but I think anybody who would say today in 2017, Israel did not kick out the Palestinians out of Palestine would be ridiculous. Exactly how it did it, I think it's up to us, the professional historians, to argue with each other. That's OK. I've, I've, for me, I have a very clear view of what happened. I had all the criticism against what uh, I did. I'm still very strongly convinced that the small group of Zionist leaders and military commanders from February 48, not before, February 48, thought that the Arab reaction to the partition plan provided the pretext. And that's why already in February 48, they expelled three villages around Caesarea, what is Caesarea today, under the eyes of the British, under the eyes of the international community, while the Arab world is not doing anything. They're very encouraged by their operation in February, four, that's February 48. And I think what really matters is April 48, the urban, the, the, the destruction of the urban um, uh, space. 
uh, I, I don't have quotes with me, but in, in, and I didn't bring, I didn't find, this is a quote I found after I published the ethnic cleansing. So I'm publish, I'm, inserti, I'm inserting that quote into a new edition that I hope to, to bring, because Simcha Flapan gave me that quote after I published the book. Simcha Flapan is also one of the new historians. And he interviewed uh, Ben-Gurion. And uh, Ben-Gurion says to him... He personally interviewed Ben-Gurion yeah, before he passed away. Uh, yeah, uh, before he passed away. And he, and he brings a, a quote in his book, uh, The Birth of Israel, uh, where Ben-Gurion says to him, of course we had to destroy the cities of Palestine. They were the brain of the Palestinians. You needed, and it did not, we, we, we did it by destroying their economic infrastructure, uh, the villages around them, and by having a proper urban warfare, uh, and that's how we, we something like that. Again, I don't and want to. This give, is a, this is in reference to April, May, forty-eight. April, May, yeah. Not, not no, no, April, May, and it can be found in the book by Simcha Flapan, the birth of Israel. I think it's even a quote that opens one of the chapter. But I may be wrong there, and we can check it later on. Um, uh, that's, that's almost a smoking gun quote, if you want. But even without it, even without it, I think um, when you go to the orders of Plan D, again, I'm saying the orders of Plan D, uh, it's very clear that you attack the villages around the cities, then you attack the cities themselves, uh, and you cause the population to flee. So given that, how does one account for the fact that today's uh, Israel, within 48 borders, mm -hmm. uh, still has a population of at least 20% Arab. Yeah, yeah. Well, ethnic cleansing is not a complete success. It was not bad. One million in the in the area that became the Jewish state, one million Palestinians lost uh, became refugees. Almost one million. Uh, uh, a small. We don't. I don't remember their numbers, but I think 160,000 to 200,000. Remained so that's ethnic lens. Percentage-wise, do you know? Do you know uh, yeah, just, it's, uh, it's just uh, 20 20 percent of the Palestinians who lived within what became the Jewish state were not expelled. Eighty percent were expelled. Twenty percent were kept. We have today the same percentage. Twenty percent of the Palis uh, of the population of Israel are Palestinians. So the percentage has not changed. Has not changed. It's the same percentage. Um, the natural growth was much tripled than the one on the Jewish side. So that explains the, the growth in population. Israel became also very greedy. Uh, in '49, it annexed Wadi Ara, an area which was part of the West Bank, uh, and voluntarily incorporated a large number of Palestinians that increased the number of the Palestinian minority. As you know, the second biggest Palestinian concentration in Israel today is Wadi Ara. Uh, this uh, valley that connects the, the sea with uh, the eastern valleys of Palestine. Um, uh, so they, you know, intention... That's, that's uh, exclusive to the triangle, or that's, that's, that's part, one in the triangle same? Triangle and Wadi Ara together, it's the same area, the right. same area, which is not part of Israel in January 49. It only became part of Israel in June 1949. So they saw it's, an opportunity, captured it, but they couldn't engage in successful ethnic, ethnic cleansing at they that point did, because... They uh, did. Dayan was responsible for expelling quite a lot of people from those areas between 48 and 67. But not enough, uh, from his perspective. He was not allowed to, to. You cannot do the same in '49 that you did in '48. Just because of the the fog of war is now has fog, lifted. Exactly, yeah. exactly. So, and do, do you know just offhand? I, 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 I'm genuinely unaware how that how those numbers compare to, let's say, the what what, what we now call the ethnic cleansing uh, that occurred in Yugoslavia, former Yugoslavia, in no, terms I, of percentages. I, do we know? I, I, I don't know. I haven't checked it to be honest. I don't know. But for me, getting rid of 80% of a population is, is massive, is huge, is a crime. And was there a discernible pattern in the sense that in today's Israel and Palestine, you see uh, a much larger percentage of the uh, population of, let's say, the Galil, so every, everywhere from the north of the West Bank northwards, um, the percentage of, of Arabs that remain there relative to the Jewish population is much higher than in the south. So do, do we have a, a historical explanation oh, yeah, for how do. that happened? We do. Uh, the Jewish forces reached the Galilee in the end of '48, and they were tired, they were exhausted. The Palestinians already knew what awaited them, so they put a fight. Uh, that's the only places where Palestinians really fought against the expulsion. 
it was much harder to expel them in the Galilee than it was in other parts. So you're saying in, in places like um, like Lydda and Ramle, they, they, they didn't see it coming uh, no, to the same no, degree? No, Lydda and Ramle is an, another story. They rely, relied on the Arab Legion. You know, the, the, if the Arab Legion would have stayed in Lydda and Ramle, they would, they would be a bloody battle. But they decided to withdraw and left the population unarmed. So they couldn't do much. So they thought the Arab Legion would defend them. And the Arab Legion they left in one day. The next day, they were occupied and expelled uh, by the orders of Rabin, who said Ben-Gurion. You remember the famous uh, movement with a hand that Ben-Gurion did to Rabin, just kick them out. In Galilee, they came later. So, so is, it, is it that the populations of Galilee had learned their lesson from the, from the rumors? Things, from few things. They learned the lessons. They had a close proximity to Lebanese villages. So people from Lebanon came and helped them. It was much easier. Literally, they came across, Literally the, came across to help them. The border with yeah, arms. yeah. You remember, there was no border. Right. There was no border. Uh, this is the last stronghold of the Arab Salvation Army of Kaouji. He made the final stands. It was tougher. It was, it was ethnic cleansing. It was tougher. And I think that's one of the reasons that in Operation Hiram, the operation that closes the war in the, in the north, October 48, some of the worst atrocities were committed by the Jewish soldiers, including rape, killing of pregnant women, and uh, massacring uh, uh, people by tying them up one to another and throwing them into, 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 into uh, pits. Uh, uh, because of a sense of desperation at that point? Yeah, Is because they, they lost people. While ethnically cleansing, they lost people. So it was revenge. It was revenge in Safsaf, in Sassa, uh, in, in, in Zetun. And, and these, by the way, are, again, Morris, uh, to his credit, uh, Morris does not believe in anything but Israeli documents, which I think is ridiculous. I think Israelis are big liars, and I wouldn't trust the documents more than I trust the oral history of the Palestinians. But then, never mind. Uh, to his credit, wherever the Israeli documents admitted the massacre, he registered it. And the massacres of October 48, shocked quite a lot of people, especially in Mapam, we mentioned them before. Uh, and that's why he could find, I remember when Morris worked in his book, the Israeli military archive was still close to him. So he went to the Mapam archive, where soldiers close, associated with Mapam had their, and ministers close to Mapam, had their memoirs, diaries, and so on, and he used them. And they really uh, pressured Ben-Gurion to investigate the atrocities uh, done in, uh, in Hiram, in, in Operation Hiram. Uh, and, and they were very graphic in their description of what the soldiers did, uh, which is really horrific. Uh, and the reason they did it was because they, they encountered... Um, more fierce resistance? Is that more fierce it? resistance. This is also one of the only re uh, places where the Israelis used extensively uh, their airplanes to, to bombard Palestinian villages to cause people to flee. One of the persons was the famous A.B. Natan, who bombarded to death uh, Tarshicha, uh, a, a village that survived. It's still with us today. Well, Israelis could not get rid of them, the Tarshicha people, so they allowed them to, to stay. So th that suggests there, there really was this, this time and, uh, and logistical pressure to accomplish this as quickly as possible. Yeah. This is, a, a, from your perspective, as yeah. quickly as possible. But in the course of that, because people had clued in, there, it was harder to do it effectively. So you saw, you saw less effective ethnic cleansing and more retribution. Is that, is that a fair yeah, assessment? Yeah, it's yeah. a fair assessment. Uh, then when uh, the, f uh, the war subsides, the few villages like uh, Ikrit and Bir'im and Rapsiye and uh, Kadisa, a few villages where the army says, we cannot allow Palestinians to be in these villages that are too strategic. And then they do something terrible. They, it's about six or seven villages. They convince them to leave the village. They tell them, go for two weeks. The army needs to survey the villages. And they destroy the village in those two weeks and tell the people, you, unfortunately, you cannot come back because we had a military uh, exercise here in the village, unfortunately. And, and because the army did a mistake, it, to two villages, it made the promise in writing. Uh, Ikrit and Birim. So they went to the Supreme High Court in Israel 
And after years and years of struggle, the Supreme Court said, you know, you're right. The army promised you to come back. And uh, the, uh, the Supreme Court said, if the army agrees, we, we don't mind if you go back. Well, the army doesn't agree. So, but but uh, this is just settler colonialist movement, like the Zionist movement, when it becomes a settler state, we saw it in South Africa, also in the United States and Canada. Uh, they adapt themselves to new realities. For example, you cannot genocide Native Americans uh, at a certain moment in the 20th century. You cannot hunt down Aboriginals anymore in Australia at a certain moment. So you use other means. In Canada, you, you, you kidnap the kids and you send them to schools, supposedly schools, where they're really morally tortured and abused. Uh, okay, you don't kill them, but you kill their soul. Uh, the native people in the world really were victimized by settler colonialism on a level that is as bad as the Holocaust, but they're not allowed to say it. They're not allowed to say it. There is hard, only well, now in, the, that in Canada you don't, have, you don't have a memorial museum for the genocide or whatever was done to the First Nations. Not yet. I'd like to think we're getting there, but I it's, hope it's so. been a slow process. I hope so. Process, uh, yeah. America only now is willing to look at African-American, I mean, the Holocaust of the slaves was worse than the one in, in Germany, it was much longer, the numbers were higher. Of course, each, each case is, is horrific by itself. You know, the German modern industrial nation doing this is... Who, who can, uh, my family was lost there, so I, I know what I'm talking about, but this idea that you could really downgrade what happened to the native people, where, uh, and in the case of Palestine, you downgrade it because the victimizers are Jews. That's the main problem for the, the poor Palestinians have no chance because the people who abused them were the ultimate victims of the 20th century. And they have, for some reason, the world thinks that they are, they are the ones who have to pay the price for this. That's why Israel was absolved in 48 from the crimes it committed. Still is absolved from the crimes it commits against the Palestinian people. And remember, there's always a pretext. The Israelis will tell you, you know, there's suicide bombs, there's terrorism. We're not doing it out of a plan. It's retaliation. It's retaliation. It's interesting. Israel always needs a pretext. Um, but when you check the retaliation, you see no connection between the act and the retaliation. And then you think, so maybe the retaliation is part of something bigger. I'll give you an example. You're saying there's never any connection? or there's Hardly any connection. If I throw a stone, even if I stab you and I come from a village, you cannot punish the whole village for the fact that I stabbed your brother or sister. Well, you can. It's just illegal no, under can. international law. You can. Yeah, yeah. But, but it's not... It's not because it's a retaliation. The collective punishment serves something deeper. I'm here. I'm powerful. I can fuck you all in the village. Yes, I, I'm, sometimes I need an excuse for this. Sometimes I don't even need an excuse. You cannot starve the whole people of Gaza because a, a Qassam missile was launched from Gaza. Of course you can. You know what I mean when I say you can't. <laughs> Uh, you don't destroy a whole uh, neighborhood in America because there is a gang there that robbed the bank, killed, uh, I don't know, killed even innocent civilians. You don't use F-16 to bomb that neighborhood. Uh, that, yes, that, that, that pulls it into focus, I think, that yeah. comparison, right? You, you know, it's, it's, uh, and therefore I think it's, it's part of an ideology, a worldview. And I think what is so elusive for us as academics is the smoking gun question, uh, the empirical question. It's, I don't think there is a document in Israeli military headquarters that says, you know, all these retaliations are actually part of our strategy and so on. Every now and then, it slips for them. When the Israeli chief of the general staff says about the, what they call the Dachaya doctrine, that is, the Haya was the Shiite uh, neighborhood of Beirut that in 2006 was carpet bombed by Israel. And he explained that the Haya doctrine is you, you, you engrave in the, how do you put it? He said, he said you, you sort of make sure that 
the people would be burnt in such a way, I don't remember exactly his word, but there was something there about making them suffer in such a way that they will not do it again. Okay, something like that. So he admitted that was, there was a collective a punishment so that the, society, the community would not support any more uh, insurgency or something uh, like that. That phrasing reminds me uh, almost directly of what I've, what I've read and, and heard about uh, how the British reacted to the Arab revolts in, oh, in the Oh, absolutely. 30s. Oh, they're using the repertoire. Uh, I, I remember one, one PhD student in Haifa writing about how the Israeli army were using the repertoire of the British in 36 to 39. That's interesting. Do you think there was direct continuity there, or is it just any occupying force? No, no, there, force? Is, there, is, there was direct continuity. You, you know, unfortunately, Franz Fanon wrote about it. This is true not about only settler colonialism. It's true about post-colonialism as well. The secret service of the liberated people used the same techniques that the colonialist power used against their enemies. That's unfortunate. Because it's effective, I It's effective. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Exactly. They don't need to invent the wheel. Right. So... It's not surprising that the Israelis are using the same methods that the British used, not only in Palestine, also in, in uh, Kenya and elsewhere. The whole emerg Israel is built on emergency regulations that allows the democracy actually to forget about this de democracy. Is there an argument then to be made, uh, maybe this is stretching, but is there an argument to be made that Israel's behavior is essentially the culmination of uh, centuries of what the British learned as being an occupying colonial force around the world, they, they honed their techniques. And what we saw in Palestine was really the peak and essentially the end of the British colonial project. Yeah. So they had refined these, these practices and the Israelis inherited them. They did, although the peak comes in, in Kenya against the, uh, uh, the Mau Mau there, really what the British did in the 50s and also in Malaysia and Indonesia. And they, they still have a, an extra mile to go in the 50s with uh, teaching us how to, how to punish uh, whole populations for uh, a war of liberation. But yes, I, I think it's part of it. And you know, Israel, the whole, st what annoys me with Israel is always not that it's exceptionally bad or that it did the Palestinians things that nobody else did in the world. It's, they're not. The two things, first of all is the uh, righteous fury. Uh, that goes along with the Israeli uh, reaction when their cr crimes are being exposed. Their inability to acknowledge these crimes, their inability to see the connection between the acknowledgement of the crimes and the chances of reconciliation, as was admitted by the white community in South Africa. You know, and we're far away from that. But that, without that, there will be no peace here. And, and, and secondly, of course, is this um, basic idea with which I, I don't know how to, to deal with it, but it won't help, like, which is inherently part of any settler colonial movement. The native becomes the immigrant, the alien. Just, just con conceptually within Israeli society. Israeli society, I mean. and what can you do? I mean, Israelis can really go to Europe as experts and say to the British and the Belgium, we can advise you how to deal with Muslim immigrants because we have a similar problem. I heard it with my own ears. They really say, we don't, don't worry, we, we even have a bigger problem than you are. The Muslim immigrants in our society is much bigger in percentage than in yours. So we, we knew how to, Israel Katz said it, uh, Jeff Alpert quotes him in his new book, brilliant book, uh, in which Israel Katz, the minister of uh, transport. He comes to Belgium after the uh, attacks on Brussels and he says... This was recently, within the very, past two very years. Recently, yeah. Very recently, he said, Israel has a huge Muslim population, many of them are terrorists, and we know how to deal with it. You have a small community, let us advise you. We, we know how to do it. So the Palestinians, I'm not talking even about the fact that Palestinians are all Muslims and terrorists. Forget about that. They are immigrants. They are like the Muslims who came from Morocco to Brussels. That's the basic Israeli notion. Right, so it's almost this Kafkaesque. Uh, exactly, exactly. And what is amazing that they thought about them like that in '48.